Welcome to Bookmarked by Ashoka Podcast. I am Samantha Sampson, the host for this episode. Today with me we have Professor Rita Kothari, who is a professor of English and the director of MA in English program at Ashoka University. She is also the co-director of Ashoka Center for Translation. As a multilingual scholar and a translator, she has worked extensively on translating gujarati and sindhi writing into english and occasionally vice versa today she is here to talk about her latest book uneasy translations self experience and indian literature welcome professor first of all congratulations on your book uh, we wanted to just help our audience to understand what this book is all about thank you so much samantha uh, this book actually emerges at one level out of thinking almost through a lifetime uh as to what does for instance language do for us what it is to know english language to not know it to not know it well enough in a way that you begin to experience shame at your accent uh you you feel a certain diminished sense of self and i have taught through various constituencies right i have taught students who come from dalit communities tribal communities then very elite students management students engineering students and the questions of english language the question of what is institutionalized knowledge and how certain forms of knowledge making exclude some students but foreground some other students has been very central to the way i think of my experience as a teacher uh and at another level the book is also in some sense my own journey with multiple literatures and multiple languages that i that i work with so your book begins with the line it must have begun as some kind of transaction is translation also some kind of transaction it is i mean at one level it is a linguistic transaction right between between two languages it is also a transaction of meaning it is a transaction of context but what i want to also emphasize is that this transaction does not happen only when let's say someone like me who's officially or visibly translating this transaction happens even to you it happens to all of us even in our everyday life right that you moment you leave home you're taking a cab you're going in the metro you're ordering something someone else is throwing some words at you you're throwing some words at them there are ways by which our social transactions and the exchanges that happen between languages all that is a part of our everyday life but in the book when i actually begin by saying it must have begun as some kind of transaction i'm also referring to pedagogy i'm referring to teaching and saying that my family was going through a lot of financial troubles at that time and i was trying to help them by teaching little children in the neighborhood and i'm saying that is how maybe teaching began for me as a transaction in some sense it is still a transaction i get a salary for teaching but i think that moment also is something i want to talk about as a moment which is of embodying right of embodying different my own experiences uh dealing with students experiences talking about various kinds of texts whether it is a play a short story a novel from kannada malayalam hindi gujarati i teach all kinds of literatures and in that process there are also ways by which we transact with those different kinds of knowledges so that remains very central actually 
to that engagement is a very central one right so in the book you talk about the uneasiness and the dissonance in translation yeah. are there any specific instances in your professional and your personal life yeah. that uh, where this became evident it was fully evident to me always that my personal life had so little to do with my professional life it's almost like the two don't face each other i mean let me give you an example even this book for instance i was showing a video to my mother at of the book discussion at the bangalore international center she doesn't understand english my mother studied up to third standard in hindi medium uh sindhi medium actually and uh, i'm showing her the video and she's looking at it and saying that it's such a joy to see you and i said mummy can i tell you what i'm saying and she said uh, she said don't worry about that i'm just looking at you and in the video i was talking about how people we write about seldom actually manage to read what we are writing right in the sometimes even that requires a translation right i would have translated into sindhi and tell my mother mummy ma hi pai chawa ma ho pai chawa but this is just one example there are many other communities i write about they can't read my books and sometimes you have to tell them that you know mai tumhara vishay au lakhyu che and you say it in gujarati you say it you try and connect these different people sometimes through translation sometimes it helps but there are often huge distances and it doesn't help i think i'm acutely aware samantha of these dissonances i'm acutely aware of how the families we come from are so different from the persona we acquire in our professional life the questions we pursue in our professional life and in some sense i think the book is making a plea to say that i love those other lives to puncture what you do in a classroom what you write your books aloud allow it to puncture allow it to actually push theory to answer those questions we cannot have knowledge that continues to be rarefied and so abstracted out of everyday life the book is making that plea actually you are a practicing translator and you also theorize translation how does one feed into the other and what are the intellectual stakes of translations for you i'm a practicing translator in situations that people can see me as a translator right that are people would say oh, rita kutari has translated such and such novel such and such book but i do not see myself as a translator only of books i see myself as someone who sees life through acts of translation that in some sense what academic knowledge is today i might be translating that into some other words right when the doctor gives you diagnosis of something and you say can you explain in simple words it is a translation right and i take those questions to translation theory and in some sense what i try to do is that i look at many examples of literary writing through acts of translation so it feeds a lot into my my work for instance there's a dalit novel i teach in one of my courses and there's an old man uh in this dalit novel his name is bhavan bhagat matlab wo bhagwan ka aadmi hai he talks in a particular way and he always talks about ki duniya mein ye karna padta hai vyavhar mein ye karna padta hai लेकिन स्पिरिचुअल डोमेन में कुछ और करना पड़ता है पॉलिटिकल में वो भी करना पड़ता है तो हमको व्यवहार समझना चाहिए आई आई हैव स्पेंड सम टाइम्स लेक्चर्स जस्ट मेकिंग स्टूडेंट अंडरस्टैंड व्हाट इज व्यवहार राइट व्हाट इज दैट पर्टिकुलर फॉर्म ऑफ सोशल अंडरस्टैंडिंग एंड सोशल ट्रांजेक्शन और आई माइट स्पेंड लेक्चर्स ऑन अंडरस्टैंडिंग द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ धर्म right and the fact that it cannot be translated in some sense what does that untranslatability tell us so the intellectual stakes that i'm interested in come from the questions of how recalcitrant how stubborn certain forms of experiences are that you cannot actually uh, words are somewhat inadequate to explain them and which is also why 
there is a chapter in the book about Hindi film songs because words will not do it for you. आँखों से बात करनी पड़ेगी, दिल की बात करनी पड़ेगी, इशारों से बात करनी पड़ेगी, right? So why ishara? क्योंकि कई बार शब्द पूरी बात नहीं कहते. So the book is constantly playing with what words do, what they can't do. Sometimes they are excessive, sometimes they are inadequate, and what is the interaction between various languages? So really speaking, my entire intellectual stake is coming actually for from my passion of words, which is why there is a section in the prologue which is Shabdon ke piche. Yeah. And that entire section is about how I chase words. But sometimes you must also remember that you need to rise above words, right? And I give this example over there that my mother, if she in anger she would have said something and she would say, Shabdan ke pakde vethi hai, like pakad ke bethi ho tum. You know, bhool jao abhi. And then she would quote, you know, this line which she said, it's from Guru Nanak, I have no idea it is. And she said, Shabdon ke pich jo atkya, ishq ki chaadi moor na chaadiya. Manda wo ishq ka ladder, ishq ki jo seedi hai, we, that person will not be able to climb the ladder of love if you get stuck in words. But sometimes words is crucial, right? I mean, people get so outraged if you misgender them. So words are important. But I think sometimes we also need to remember that myself is larger than that pronoun, right? That pronoun does not completely capture who I am. So should we stay with words? Should we rise above them? When do we know what to do? The book is also a reflection on that. So in your book, you talk about the flight Indian students take into theory instead of theorizing particularism that they come with. Yeah which if I'm not wrong, uh, essentially means that we often discount experiences as a mere anecdote and not a part of theory. Would you say that the form you choose for the book, going between theory and experience, is an attempt to make uh, a particular experiences an essential part of how we engage with theorism? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I, uh, I, you know, that line that you quote, Samantha, from the book, it actually occurs in the first chapter where I'm talking about how when I said to my mother that, why don't you write something of your life? And she said, I tried to write. And she said, but I can't because, uh, you know, I was trying to write Hinanji Amoinji Atam Katha, as in Unki or Meri Atam Katha. Now, Atma Katha Jyoti, autobiography, is a story of oneself, myself. But really speaking, can do we go through life abstracting this self out of the many layers that surround it? Do we manage to stay alone in a way that we are completely autonomous selves only? We are not. We are always in notionally in a joint family, even when we think we are living alone. So really speaking, the genre of the autobiography manages to actually put in abeyance these multiple cells which also surround our lives and so on. So I use this particular example to then theorize what it is to write an autobiography, what it is actually to in fact not write at all. It is a theoretical question, but I think the book is not, the book is saying what is theory? If theory does not come from the challenges it receives from us, then that theory is dead, then theory is cold. You know, when I give students something to read, they get very anxious if there isn't an accompanying theoretical article. And I'm not making here some kind of a binary between theory and literature or even theory and experience. But the fact that it makes them anxious to say, okay, how do I intuitively feel about this text? What is it saying? And what you feel intuitively about something often comes from who you are, what experiences have shaped you. And there's a certain way by which we don't let that happen. Right? There is so much emphasis on the cerebral that in this idea of an embodied relationship with the text, it, we, we don't give it time 
for that to take place, for that to be expressed and so forth. And very often those particularisms which have shaped us, I think bring some of the richest perspectives to bear upon a text, but we don't do that. And students who come from very vulnerable sections, they think that the experiences that shape them, the homes they come from, is almost illegitimate. It has no room here, right? There's almost a sense of shame and they don't even want to. So the book is in some sense also a very humble nudge to those students to say, don't worry about that, that your learning and you, where you come from need not be looking into two different directions. Let them face each other. If the articles you are reading are not responding to the life you've lived, then maybe look for art other articles or ask questions of those articles that why is this article not talking about the caste experience I have had, right? Mm -hmm. So there is an example in the book from Daya Pawar's autobiography, Barut, where the mother comes to Daya Pawar's school and he does not want any of his friends to see the mother. And this is exactly what we do. We keep the experience under wraps, hidden from other people, because we think that there is something, something dark here and it's uncomfortable unless you're from a very elite family, then you can show off. And I think my, my book is actually keeping those students in mind. But it also goes to the elite students and says that maybe you might also want to think of your location and your privileges. Uh, Professor, how many languages do you speak? I mean, in the book also, you know, you're going back and forth between Sindhi, uh, Hindi and English. Gujarati, yeah, Gujarati. Marathi. Yeah. <laughs> so I understand a lot of languages of Western India and Northern India. I also understand Bangla somewhat, but I don't speak or write or read or anything. Uh, when you are from a minority language, then the onus to know the majoritarian languages is on you, okay. right? So that is what happened in my case. But the last chapter in this book actually does go a lot, very, a lot more into these questions, right? Uh, so it actually begins by thinking about failure as almost a minefield, as a very rich, fertile arena. People think of the failures of translation and they think that's the end of it. And then they think there is a triumph and there is a failure. But really speaking, losses and failures are actually very interesting places to think about. Uh, so that particular chapter begins by looking at a very lovely ghazal in Gujarati, which sort of begins by saying, you know, that we came close to fulfillment and happiness, but somehow we didn't. It didn't happen. And then it gives various examples of saying there were occasions, there were auspicious occasions that happened in our house, but they didn't become ours. Uh, and uh, then it sort of goes on to a Hindi poem, which is actually based on Munshi Premchand's story. And uh, Om Prakash Valmiki does an interpretation of that Hindi poem. Then it goes on to a novel in Gujarati. Then it goes on to a short story in Sindhi. And in all these instances, maybe I should read out yeah, a little sure. bit. I'm yeah. Okay. Let me just uh, give you maybe a little bit. Uh... Okay, I think I'll read out to you the Om Prakash Valmiki poem because that's there are. I mean, people might be more familiar with Munshi Premchand than, uh, yeah. It's a very well-known poem called Chula Thakur Ka Mitti Talab Ki Talab Thakur Ka Bukh Roti Ki Roti Bajre Ki Bajra Khet Ka Khet Thakur Ka Bel Thakur Ka Hal Thakur Ka Hal Ki Muth Par Hatheli Apni Fasal Thakur Ki Kua Thakur Ka Pani Thakur Ka खेत खलिहान ठाकुर के गली मोहल्ले ठाकुर के फिर अपना क्या गांव शहर देश 
And this poem is Om Prakash Valmiki, who is a Dalit writer. It is his interpretation of Munshi Premchand's story called Thakur Ka Khuma. Yeah? And Munshi, and Munshi Premchand shows that how this poor Dalit woman is not able to take water out of this well. Om Prakash Valmiki is writing this poem to say it is not only about the well. The point is the land also belongs to Thakur. That except labor, nothing is ours. But this question of ye thakur ka, wo thakur ka, wo thakur ka, in English language when you try and translate it, the poem does not manage to get this ka by without sometimes implying belonging and sometimes implying possessing. Right. Do you understand? Yeah. So the idea of the Hindi poem that it all is possessed by Thakur. And that because it is all possessed by Thakur, therefore nothing belongs to us and we don't belong. He manages to show you the systemic nature of caste and what is the disenfranchisement that happens there. When you do it in English, it is almost like some things belong and some things are of the Thakur. And that entire arrangement gets awry. Because that entire arrangement gets awry, the very sharp critique that Om Prakash Valmiki is making, which is a political one, which is about systems, it is about capital, it is about materiality, one is not able to do that in English. Do you get it? Yeah. So, the chapter goes into these small details to say, don't only think of loss and failure of translation as a failure of language. Sometimes, what language is actually doing is to capturing an entire philosophy. So in a Gujarati ghazal, if it says that, you know, ye sab aapka nahi hua, aap khushi ke mauke pe aai, lekin wo khushi aapki nahi hui. And the last line ends with, aaj varsad na thi, em na ko ramish, em ko hashe, aapne bhi na na thaya. Don't say that it didn't rain today. It may have rained, lekin wo barish hum ko nahi chui. अगर बारिश ने हमको छुआ नहीं तो उसमें किसकी गलती है बारिश की गलती है या हमारी गलती है द गजल डज नॉट मेक इट क्लियर बट इन इंग्लिश द वे यू ट्रांसलेटेड यू वुड हैव टू से ऑलमोस्ट लाइक इट इज द फॉल्ट ऑफ द रेन और योर फॉल्ट बिकॉज इंग्लिश इज वेरी एजेंसी ड्रिवन एंड द चैप्टर गोज ऑन टू शो दीज सिचुएशन बट आई थिंक यू शुड रीड दैट ऑन योर ओन आई डोंट वॉन्ट टू या So in your acknowledgement section, you have expressed gratitude to a number of people at Ashoka University, with one of the examples in the prologue coming from an Ashoka student. Yeah. How has your time at the university helped in the culmination of this book? Yeah, you know, when I said earlier to you, Samantha, that this book has been, in some sense, a book of many years, and yet the book gets written when I'm in Ashoka, so Ashoka is both in the sense that it proved as a very interesting catalyst for me to think more about it. Uh, but also I think I want to say this quite emphatically, there is something about Ashoka students that they allow me that reflection. That if I'm trying out a certain idea and I'm telling them that you look, I am sure sometimes I look like a digressing silly old woman to them. But I must say that they are so not only patient, they will actually sit and listen. If I tell them that, you know, I was thinking about this concept today and I don't know if I understand it right, but this is the way now I'm rethinking it. There is a way by which they understand that for this professor, these are journeys. Right. And they are not judging you for the fact that you don't always come to class with a finished product, even if there is a rawness of that journey, I find students actually just so much kinder. They will listen to it and they would say, oh, that's interesting, Professor, did you think about that? I mean, that I think is something else. I have not, I've not had such an inquiring mind. I have had far more diversity in previous institutions. And I think Ashoka can do with more diversity. But I think Ashoka students 
are very great interlocutors and I'm very thankful to them. Lovely. With this, we come to an end to our podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Your questions were great and thank you for reading the book. <laughs> and once again, congratulations on your book. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you.